We're Tony and Chelsea Northrup, professional photographers, and we both shoot with Sony cameras. We're not sponsored by Sony, but we just love their products, and we think you will too. They have the most lenses, the longest history in full frame mirrorless, but they have a lot of cameras, and that's, that's good, but finding the right one can be really difficult. So we're gonna walk you through the entire lineup to find the one that fits your budget and your style of shooting. From $750 all the way up to 6,500, there's something for everyone in this video, so stay tuned. But first, I wanna take a moment to thank our sponsor, Adorama, and they're our new sponsor, so yay! They have a huge selection of cameras, lenses, everything creators need, and they've been serving the photography community since the 70s. They've been around a while because they know what they're doing. You can sign up for their VIP program and get points back. You actually earn money every time you buy something. If you're a student, you can get discounts from that. And they have really, really quick shipping and just more stuff in stock than any other place that I can see. So be sure to use our links to check out Adorama because they're new and I want them to know that you found out about them through us. Sony has five different categories of cameras, starting with the A6000 series, which is just a general all-purpose entry-level series. Then we have the A7 series, which is a full-frame general-purpose series. There are two series for video professionals. The ZV series is for creators like us, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram. And then the FX series is more for filmmakers creating cinema. And then the top of the line series, the A92 and the Alpha 1 for wildlife and sports. We're going to break it down a little bit further, starting with general purpose cameras, and then we'll get into more specialized recommendations for people shooting video, sports, wildlife, high resolution stuff. First up, the general purpose cameras. The A6000 series is Sony's entry level. These three cameras, the A6100, 6400, and 6600, they're all APS-C cameras and they look basically the same. The screens flip up. So you can record video of yourself, but if you put a microphone in the hot shoe, you can't really see it. We'll talk about more video creator oriented cameras in a bit. The entry level camera is 750 bucks, which is a great price. And that camera will get pretty much everything you need done, but there are upgrades. The A6400 that I'm holding here is only $900, and that adds a much nicer electronic viewfinder, this little eyepiece here. These cameras have the viewfinder in the upper left corner like a rangefinder, and I love that because that means when I hold it up to my eye, it doesn't smush into my nose. The A6400 has a better quality viewfinder, so everything looks a little prettier and a little sharper, and that doesn't change your pictures, but it makes the experience a little nicer. The A6400 is also more weather sealed than the A6100, and it has S-Log, which allows you to capture more shadow and more highlight detail when you're shooting video. Lots of good reasons to get the A6400, but there's a step up, which is the A6600. This camera is more expensive and it's a little bit bigger, but it's kind of worth it because it gives you a bigger battery. And the A6100, 6400, they tend to run out of batteries pretty fast. So for me, I definitely prefer the A6600. And the bigger size makes it easier to hold for things like sports and wildlife. If you're a video creator, the A6600 also has a headphone jack, which lets you monitor your sound. The other two cameras don't have that. But it removes a feature, which is the flash. These cameras have this little bitty cute flash here, but I personally never miss that. This flash, I think it actually makes pictures worse, so I never use it. If you're debating these three cameras, get the A6100 and put the money you save towards lenses, lights, tripods, and other things that'll make a bigger difference in your photography. This is the A7C, and I think it's the cutest Sony camera available, but it's also powerful because it's a full frame camera. That means you're gonna be moving into a more powerful options of full frame lenses as well, and they're gonna allow you to have better low light capabilities, better background blur, and if you are getting more serious and you think you're eventually going to get a full frame camera anyway, you may as well start here and start building out your full frame lens lineup. Another thing is that the flip screen on the back flips out to the side. So if you have a microphone on the top, your screen will not be blocked by your microphone. It's also fully articulating. If you can afford the 1800 bucks, it's worth it to get the A7C and step up to full frame, mostly because of the lenses. The A7C is also a great second body for existing Sony shooters who want something light to travel with. 
Now we're getting into the professional cameras. This is the a7 III and a7 IV. And you'll see the design is different because it is for professional use. The viewfinder here, the eyepiece, is lined up with the lens. So the downside is it smushes your nose, but the upside is it's easier to track subjects with a telephoto lens. These cameras also have two card slots, whereas all the other cameras had just one card slot. And that means if you have a card that gets corrupted, a file that gets corrupted, if you pop it out and it falls between the boards in the boardwalk and you can't get it back, you have a backup copy of all your files. And that can be a lifesaver, especially for something like a sports game or a wedding that you can't go back and reshoot. Now the a7 III is a little bit older of a camera. It's from 2018 and you see some of that age, like the guts of it, the insides are almost exactly the same as the a7C that we just showed you, but it has a tilting screen at the back that does not flip forward. So if you're thinking of using it as a creator camera where you film yourself, that's gonna be a lot harder for you. It's a great all around camera. It can do landscapes, portraits, some sports, and at $2,000 for full frame, that's a really good price. But you might want to check out Chelsea's a7 IV here. So the a7 IV is a little bit more expensive. It's $2,500 instead of $2,000. But for that extra 25%, you get a bit more. You get a fully articulating screen, which is nice if you ever want to film yourself. And it's also nice when you're shooting down low or up high and you want to see what's going on. You get nine extra megapixels. This is 33 megapixels versus his 25. For. There's other things that you're going to notice too, like there's improved autofocus, which is crucial when you're using a telephoto lens and you're taking pictures of animals or fast moving subjects. Speaking of wildlife and autofocus, you also get bird detection autofocus, so it will spot a bird's eye and focus on that. That's cool technology that's also useful. You have the option to have a CF Express A card, which means that it's a little bit faster and I appreciate that when I'm shooting wildlife and I'm taking a lot of shots. For video, it shoots 4K 30 full frame and 4K 60 crop. So if you're interested in video, you might like this upgrade. Our video guy, Frank, also told us that he appreciated that the color science had improved in video and that the autofocus was better. But you know what I noticed? That has a new menu system and the menus aren't that big of a deal, but the a7 III has the old menu system, which is such a pain to go through. And like the touch screen doesn't work on the menus. The a7 IV has lots of usability improvements that might make it worth the extra 20, 25% price. Both cameras are very capable, but the a7 IV is a better value at its higher price point, And I think it'll last most people longer. Still doing general purpose cameras here. A step up from those are Sony's R series of cameras. The R stands for resolution. You're getting really huge images and a lot of high resolution. They both have 60 megapixel sensors and they can both do pixel shift to create up to 240 megapixel images. And that is crazy. They are huge files, but they are absolutely beautiful. But one difference between this $3,400 camera and that $4,000 A7R5 is the A7R5, the pixel shift images are actually generally more usable because the software used to process those images can actually take out camera shake and movement. So while I always got these files to be a little messed up when shooting in 240 megapixel mode, those come out pretty perfect. Otherwise, most of the differences between these are the same as the differences between the A7 III and A7 IV that we just discussed. This has a tilting screen and that has a flippy screen. This has the old menu system and that has the new menu system. This has SD cards and that takes SD or CF Express. And I'll say CF Express Type A and that makes a big difference because those big files take a long time to write to the card. It also has a higher resolution viewfinder, which I appreciate when I'm doing wildlife because it just looks crisp and real and beautiful. And if you're appreciating wildlife, you're gonna appreciate that. And you could do wildlife with the a7r5, but I wouldn't recommend it on the a7r4. See, this one has an older autofocus system. This is a very sophisticated autofocus system that can like find arms and legs and it can track airplanes and birds and anything. So for $4,000 versus $3,400, like that one's worth it. But at the same time, portraits, landscapes, the a7r4, still a really awesome 60 megapixel camera. If you're thinking about shooting action like sports or wildlife, you probably would want this upgrade. Um, and another thing to consider is that the in-body image stabilization is eight stops. So if you're hand holding at a longer shutter speed, you're gonna get crisper photos. 
Obviously these R cameras have bigger files and that means they take longer to write, they take longer to offload. Processing them is a little bit slower and they'll take up more storage space, which can cost you some more money. But the other disadvantage to the high megapixel sensors is rolling shutter when you're shooting video. It takes a long time to read out that whole 60 megapixel sensor. And as a result, if you're panning the camera or shooting fast moving subjects, you can actually see visible tilting in those things. So the a7 III and a7 IV make better video cameras than these do. If you plan to make big prints or crop a lot, get one of the a7R cameras. The a7R IV is perfect for landscapes and portraits. Get the a7R V if you're shooting any moving subjects or video autofocus. If you know the camera that you want, head to our description, click on the link and go to Adorama. They have a massive selections of cameras, lenses, tripods. If you need it for photography, they have it and they have competitive prices, great deals. They have the deal of the day, which is fun to click on and see what's for sale that day. And they have shipping that's rush shipping if you need something last minute, free shipping on a bunch of items. So head to Adorama. But what if you don't know the camera you want? What if you're still confused by this incredibly complicated video? They have help there. You can call their phone number or you can chat with them and they can answer questions. They can help you find the right camera. So thanks for sponsoring us, Adorama, and thanks for making it easier for creators of all type to get the equipment that they need. That was all general purpose, what we call hybrid cameras. They can shoot stills, they can shoot video, but Sony has cameras made for filmmakers and creators like ourselves. They have a few distinct features. One is there's no optical viewfinder, just a rear screen, a flip screen that flips forward. And that makes the whole body a little bit smaller, a little bit lighter. And not only is that easier to carry, but it's easier to put it on a gimbal for shots like what my cameraman is doing right now. There are two series here. The ZV series is what I'm holding in my hand. This is meant for Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. It's perfect for people like us. And they have two ZV series cameras. They have the ZV-E10, which is an APS-C camera. So that means a little bit less expensive, a little bit smaller, a little bit lighter, but you don't get quite the same background blur and you don't get quite the same low light capability. You'll have a little bit more noise and low light. Or you can upgrade to the full frame ZV-E1 that I'm holding here. This is brand new. And when you upgrade to this, you get all that extra background blur, all that bokeh, otherwise pretty similar capabilities. The ZV cameras are a little bit better at video than those hybrid cameras because they, they have a product showcase mode, which means you don't have to hide behind the camera whenever you hold something up, the lock onto the thing that's closest. They also have sophisticated microphones built in in case you don't use an external microphone, you can get significantly better sound. I think my favorite thing about the new ZV-E1 is it can automatically autofocus on two people in a frame. Sometimes Chelsea and I've had a problem where one of us goes out of focus and the other person is in focus and all the other cameras can only focus on one person, but the ZV-E1 in particular will focus on two people and track them as they move around. Pretty cool. If you want a dedicated camera, not for stills, but for personal video, for social media, YouTube, the ZV cameras are perfect for you. If you can afford the full frame model, that's definitely an advantage, but Sony does have a great selection of APS-C lenses for the ZV-E10. So if you don't have a big budget, get the less expensive camera and save the extra money for lenses. I said that the ZV-E10 and ZV-E1 are for creators and the FX series is for filmmakers. The footage out of them will look almost identical, but the difference is the FX series has a built-in cage. So there are mounts all over it and that makes it easier to mount to a tripod or a gimbal, but it also makes it easier to connect separate lights for handheld shots or a microphone and just provides greater flexibility. Those two FX cameras, they also come with two card slots and that allows you to have a backup in case you lose a card or a card gets damaged. If you're just doing video for social media, get a ZV series camera, but if you're a serious professional, you need two card slots, you'll probably end up building out a rig of some kind. FX is perfect for you. The full frame FX3 is definitely worth it, but if your budget is lower, Sony has a good set of APS-C lenses for the FX30. There is one more video camera worth mentioning and that's what we're actually filming this on and that's the Sony A7S III. The A7S III has the same lower megapixel, 12 megapixel sensor as the ZV-E1 and FX3, but it also has a viewfinder. So it makes a better hybrid camera 
if having the lower megapixels doesn't bother you that much. Maybe that uh, bird will come back for me. All those cameras are good for shooting some action or sports. Like they'll all do 10 or 11 frames per second. But these two cameras go way beyond that. If you're shooting action, having more frames per second means you have more options. It means you can pick that split second moment when the football touches the receiver's fingers or when the bird's flapping wings are in just the perfect position. I have the A9 Mark II, which is $4,500 and it does 20 frames per second with 24 megapixels. I have the Alpha One, which is $6,500. It does 30 frames per second. That means you don't miss a thing when you're taking wildlife photos. It has 50 megapixels, which is super high resolution. That one has a lot of advantages. I mean, it's 2000 bucks more. Yeah. It has the CF Express Type A cards, so it can offload things faster. And that's actually really a problem on this A9 Mark II because you're shooting 20 frames per second. You fill up the buffer, and then it can take more than a full minute to empty that buffer. And while it's buffering, you can't like switch to video or access some menu settings. So the fact that the A1 clears out the buffer much faster this is a big advantage. That's not just a feature that works well on paper. I see this all of the time when I'm shooting with this camera. I think I'm getting the best photo of the bird and then they turn into better light or they turn their fish just the right way. And I'm so glad that I'm not buffering because I'm capturing the perfect moment. Another advantage that A1 has for wildlife is that viewfinder. It's 9 million dots and it's so beautiful. I swear it's like better than real life. It's beautiful, but also there's no lag. So if you're tracking the bird, it almost seems like you're doing it in real time versus a viewfinder where there is lag. And oftentimes you can lose your subject in the frame because it's just not keeping up. And you can choose an option to scale those pictures down so you don't have to offload huge pictures all the time. But overall, that's the A1 is the better choice for wildlife or really anything, landscapes, portraits, sports. It's the camera that can do almost anything. The A9 here is a really good choice for sports though, because it's less expensive and 20 frames per second is enough and 24 megapixels is generally enough for sports. So that's how you kind of choose between these two. But this one has better video. 8K video at 30 frames per second. And it's just gorgeous, especially if you are shooting video of wildlife that lets you crop and post or follow a subject as it moves around the frame. Yeah, much better overall camera, especially for that just 30% price difference. I will say neither of these are great hybrid cameras like because neither one of them have a flip screen. They both only have a tilting screen. So if you're hoping to use it to also film yourself, you're going to have to get a second body. The A9 is plenty for professional sports and portrait shooters, but if you want a multi-purpose camera that can do landscapes and big prints or crop tightly for wildlife, the A1 is definitely worth it, and it's both of our personal cameras. Down in the comments below, let us know which Sony camera you're shooting with, what you like about it, what you don't like about it, and what you would recommend to others. And of course, if you want to buy a new camera, go to the description down below and click the link to Adorama because you can get the best deals there. They have rush shipping. They have excellent customer support. So if you're still not sure after all this, you can ask one of the people on their knowledgeable team about which camera is right for you. Thanks, Adorama. Bye.